please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Well, Prime Minister Modi has hit out at the UPA government's handling of the economy and has even accused the budget figures of being suspicious. In an interview to Swarajya magazine, the Prime Minister spoke extensively about the state of the economy in 2014 when the NDA took charge. He said, and I quote, the state of the economy was much worse than expected. Things were terrible. Even the budget figures were suspicious, end of quote. In what was a scathing attack, the Prime Minister went on to say, and I quote again, the details about the DK in the Indian economy were unbelievable. It had the potential to cause a crisis all over, end of quote. The Prime Minister also addressed claims over lack of job creation, underlining the need for a robust mechanism to ensure job growth. The Prime Minister said, and I quote, India had around 60 sacks. 6 lakh registered enterprises from independence till July last year. In just one year, 48 lakh new enterprises got registered. Will this not result in more formalization and better jobs? End of quote. The Prime Minister also quoted the EPFO data and the surge in mudra loans to claim that job creation under his government has not been tepid. He has, of course, also spoken about the GST and said a one rate uh, cannot be a possibility. You cannot tax a Mercedes and milk at the same rate of tax. Joining us now to discuss the claims made by the Prime Minister is former Finance Minister Yashwan Sinha. We'll also be joined by other guests shortly. Mr. Sinha, I appreciate you joining us here on CNBC TV 80. Let me start by asking you about what you make of the claims that the Prime Minister has made specifically when it comes to the performance of the UP. I mean, no secret about the fact that the economy was uh, troubled, extremely troubled. But to say that Things were terrible and the budget figures were suspicious. And I also, uh, you know, it's interesting because four of the five budgets presented by UPA2 were presented by the former president, Pranam Mukherjee. There was one budget presented by Chidambaram and an interim budget that was presented by Chidambaram. But the blame seems to rest purely on uh, the former finance minister, P. Chidambaram. Well, uh, you know, it comes um, uh, four years too late. Uh, all that you have to do, Shireen, is to go back to the budget speech of uh, the finance minister, Mr. Arun Jaitley, of 2014-15. Uh, when he presented his budget, uh, we were all disappointed, uh, in a manner of speaking, that he did not pull up the UPA as much as he should have. Mm. Now, the prime minister saying that mm. it was worse than what had been imagined uh, in 2014, four years after the event, does not carry conviction. Mm. Why didn't they expose the mm. UPA then and there? I mean, he says that it would have done uh, damage to the economy. Wouldn't it do damage to the economy today when he says all these things? Mm. So it is very difficult mm. to believe the prime minister when he says things were much worse than they had imagined. Perhaps he did not have the information on uh, the state of the economy like some of us had in 2014, and that's mm. why he went out and made some outlandish uh, promises, like bringing 15 lakhs mm. to every account in India and other things. But the fact remains mm. that the, the finance minister's uh, budget speech which is approved word by word by the Prime Minister, does not reflect the points that, or the point that um, the Prime Minister is making now. Yeah, uh, if I may bring in the interviewer as well, uh, R. Jagannathan, the editor of Swaraj, also with us. Uh, Jaggi, uh, you know, in this interview, he clearly seems to be blaming the former finance minister, P. Chidambaram, for not presenting a correct statement of the finances, in fact, saying that the budget figures were suspicious. But, you know, I'm just going back to the economic survey uh, that was presented. And the economic survey very categorically stated the fiscal deficit of the center as a proportion of the GDP also declined in the second year for the row, as per the medium-term policy stance, reflecting that there was a change for the better from a macroeconomic perspective. The worst is clearly behind us. Uh, and it points to the fact that the revival of the growth had started in 2013-14 and attained further vigor in 14-15. So it doesn't quite seem to add up with the claims that the Prime Minister is now making about the catastrophe that was the economy. No, no, I think a lot of things were on a downward spiral at that point. But for uh, the oil bonanza that came six months later, 
I think uh, you would have definitely had a terrible economy in 2014-15. And in fact, you should hmm. not read the economic survey. You should read Chidambaram's interim budget speech where he clearly said he was rolling over 35,000 crores of dues pertaining to 13-14 to 14-15. And uh, he, uh, he claimed he yeah. inherited a deficit of 45,000 crore and then he claimed I'm still rolling over 35,000 crore. That alone says that a part of what hmm. Mr. Modi says hmm. is correct. So, and uh, many other things, don't forget, mm. the oil sector was in a complete mess. I mean, all the oil companies were sick, and but sure. for the uh, thing, uh, you had the aviation uh, sector in a mess, you had the coal mining sector in a mess, you had telecom heading for a disaster. I mean, yeah. uh, I think it was not, uh, and banks, of course, were coming, were hiding all their bad loans. So, I mean, he, I think it's fair to yeah. say, you're saying whether he uh, said it now, I don't think he said it now. I asked him a question, why didn't you restate budget? That's okay. the explanation he gave. Huh? Yeah, okay. Uh, let me go back across now to Mr. Yashwan Sina. And sir, I want to pick up on the point that the Prime Minister has made in this issue when it comes to job creation. Uh, and I'm quoting to you what uh, uh, Mr. Modi is saying. On this issue, more than a lack of jobs, the issue is a lack of data on jobs. Our opponents will naturally exploit this opportunity. He then goes on to talk about, uh, you know, where the jobs have been created. For instance, common service centres which are running across the country, the EPFO data, which shows that more than 41 lakh formal jobs were created between September of 2017 to April of 2018. Uh, so net-net, the Prime Minister is saying that this is a fallacious argument that is being perpetuated that there has been jobless growth to the extent that the opposition claims. And even people like you claim. Well, uh, you know, let me uh, say that I agree with the Prime Minister partially in the sense that job data does not come to us immediately. It comes to us with a lag. Now, having said mm. that, I would also like to point out that we have the Labor Bureau in the Ministry of Labor, which on the basis of uh, uh, quarterly surveys, household surveys, comes out with uh, job uh, creation uh, data. And uh, that data is completely mm. at variance with the claims which have been which are being made by the government. There are number of experts mm. who have pointed out that EPFO data is not job data, and there are serious flaws in the EPFO data. Yes. So you cannot say yes. that um, all the jobs which uh, EPFO claims have been formalized are new job mm. creation uh, figures. If, you know, we are all aware of the okay. fact that you have to reach a figure of 20 in order to register with the EPFO. If you have 19, you don't. So you add one more and all the 20 will then become um, uh, formal, formalized jobs in the economy. But actually mm. one job has been created. Okay. So therefore, everyone agrees that EPFO data is not job creation data. And it will be a grievous error. Mm -hmm. And playing with the statistics to say that EPFO has um, given us these figures and so many jobs have been created. Okay, let me also bring in a quick comment here from Manish Tiwari before I go back to Jaggi because I do know that uh, uh, Jaggi did in his interview put that specific uh, point across to the Prime Minister that there is criticism about the use of the EPFO data to bear out the claim of job creation. Uh, Manish Tiwari, uh, uh, you know, we're picking up on the comments made by the Prime Minister in his interview to Swaraj. Uh, we were talking about the Prime Minister saying that the opposition parties are making a fallacious argument when it comes to the lack of job creation. Your quick comment on that before I get uh, Jaggi in. Well, uh, the Prime Minister is absolutely in the wrong. The fact is that the Prime Minister promised two crore jobs a year when he was campaigning in 2013-14 to become the Prime Minister of India. Now, the question is that going by the Prime Minister's own commitment, and I'm not getting into statistical jugglery at this point in time, uh, there should have been mm. eight crore new jobs which should have been created, not employment opportunities. And going by whatever empirical mm. data is available uh, from government sources, the Ministry of Labor, it points to the fact that till 2017, 
you know, less than six lakh jobs have been created. So therefore, if the prime minister feels that the opposition's claims are fallacious or they are being made primarily to score a political point, then the prime minister and his government need to put out substantive concrete data in order to debunk those claims rather than merely shooting mm. the breeze and trying to shoot the messenger in the process. Mm. Uh, Jackie, a quick comment from you, because I do know that you did press the Prime Minister on this point. Yeah, look, uh, I don't agree that uh, EPFO data represents new jobs. I mean, very a small portion of it may indeed represent. Largely, it is about formalization of jobs. So it could be that for jobs that were other, earlier not captured or in the informal sector may have shifted to the formal sector now that you have the pressure points like GST and uh, also there was an amnesty last year and all kinds of things. So in, it makes sense for it. Does. However, mm. it is equally fallacious to say that we had jobless growth. We have not. Our problem is not jobless growth because in mm. India you can't afford to be without a job. Our problem is the wage problem, which Manish Sabarwal keeps emphasizing. That our problem is our yeah. jobs are not of the quality yeah. which gives you enough earnings. And if you look at the World Bank figures, they are also saying at a 0.2 elasticity of employment, we are actually at 7% growth, you will be generating 6 million jobs a year. And only thing is we do not know how we are mm. counting it because nobody has yet counted it. So I don't think jobless growth is at all correct. Yeah. I think we are definitely generating 6 million jobs at least. We may need to generate about 8 or 9 million in order to take care of all the people who are coming to work and willing to work. Of course, a lot of people are also going into studies and other things. So uh, at the labor force product uh, rate, uh, participation rate of about 50%, you need about 8 or 9 million. So we are probably about 3 million short on the actual jobs we need to create. Short of that? Yeah. Okay. Let me then move to the claim uh, uh, or the question that, uh, that you asked the Prime Minister when it comes to the growth in the farm sector and the commitment made by the government to farmers. And Mr. Sinha, let me start by asking you, there is of course that uh, oft-repeated uh, claim of doubling farmers' income by 2022, uh, which the government continues to maintain that it will deliver on. And the Prime Minister saying that they followed a four-pronged strategy to achieve that goal. Bid se bazar tak is how he has termed the interview. Uh, in this uh, interview, uh, you know, do, do you believe that this is this is perhaps the single biggest area of disappointment that they didn't understand the distress that the farm sector was faced with, and the measures of the intervention that is that are now being rolled out is perhaps too little, too late. Absolutely, you know, we had uh, the BJP has promised in its manifesto that it will faithfully implement the Swaminathan Commission report including giving the farmers 50% profit over cost. Now, it has taken them four years, and this promise has been made in the last budget of this government, whereas it should have been made in the very first budget. Second is that Monday prices all over the country for the last many years have been so low that the farmer is not getting... Um, even his uh, return on the uh, uh, labor and capital invested. And there is a statistics to prove that in the last four years, uh, instead of increasing, far, farm incomes have depressed by 1.8 or something percentage. So all in all, on the agrarian front, the government has failed miserably to keep not only to keep up the promises, but even maintain the momentum. Mm. And you have any number of reports in the media now to show how almost in every uh, farm produce, the Monday prices are way below the, uh, the MSP, wherever there is MSP. And uh, the procurement agents of the government do not buy the farmers produce. And I have seen it myself in Maharashtra mm. and in Madhya Pradesh, the distress in which the, the farmers are. So if you were to ask me, I would say that one of the major failure of this government has been on the uh, farming front, on the farmers issue, and to say that farmers' income will be doubled in 2022 is like... Uh, promising the moon when you will not be there.
What is the guarantee that this government will be there in 2022 and that what they have not done between 2014 and 2018, they'll be able to do hmm. in the next four years. Okay. A quick comment from you, Manish Tiwari, before I get Jaggi back in. Well, there has been unprecedented agrarian distress uh, across the country, and that has manifested itself in uh, farmers' movements taking place at various places, including the historic march that you saw in Maharashtra, whereby farmers uh, walked to the state secretariat in order to... Uh, in order to articulate their grievances. Mr. Yashwan Sinha himself has gone and participated in many of these farmer movements in uh, Varda and uh, in Madhya Pradesh and uh, in various other parts of the country. So therefore, uh, mm. insofar as the farm sector is concerned, I don't think that this government really has a measure of what exactly is required to be done. And that is... Uh, possibly mm. best manifested in the fact that there has been hardly any growth, even in the minimum support prices. Not that minimum support price is a panacea for all the agrarian problems which uh, uh, India really faces. No, but it's it is not. an indicator of the approach which this government has uh, towards the uh, farm sector per se. And there are fundamental reforms which the agricultural sector requires, including relooking at the fact that with, given the current size yeah. of India's land holding, agriculture has become completely economically unviable. So therefore, these are hard mm. issues mm. which a, a government needs to grapple with if you really want to boost the productivity of the farm sector and double the incomes of the farmers. And I completely agree with Mr. what Mr. Yashwan Sinha said. You know, they are, you are promising doubling by 2022. The term of this government ends in 2019. And going by the manner in which uh, the consultation... But they're confident that they're coming back. ...shaping up, I don't think there's going to be a 2022, uh, forget a 2022, <laughs> even a 2020 for this government. I, I'm not a psychologist. I'm not going to go down that road. But, Jaggi, let me come to you with your <laughs> assessment on uh, what seems to be the strategy as far as the farm sector is concerned now. It seems fairly clear that we're back to short-term fixes and something has, uh, has not quite fallen into place as far as this government's strategy on agriculture is concerned. Uh, let me put it this way. The problem of farm distress and low incomes is real. But none of the gentlemen you've talked to, whether it's Yashwan Sinha or Manish Tiwari, has any clue how they're going to do it. They only know that there is a distress, so they talk about MSPs and all. MSPs are not a solution. When you have 15% of the GDP coming from 45% of the people, obviously yeah. the only way you can double income is by reducing the number of people in agriculture and uh, by doing other kinds of things. The logical thing to do is to cut the subsidies by half and give the things. The logical thing to do is to cut the subsidies by half and give the entire value of the subsidies in the form of a per acre subsidy to farmers who are very mm. uneconomical, uneconomical farms and say, now you manage yeah. uh, how you want to manage. You've got to have radical solutions. You can't keep having farm loan waivers and yeah. MSP hikes of 50% and whatever it is. It will completely ruin the farm sector if it is dependent mm. on such kind of uh, you know, doles. You might as well get, make it a formal dole, give them a subsidy per acre per hectare yeah. of, say, 5,000 rupees uh, per year or whatever it is, and automatically they, they will do much better. They will start then looking for jobs. They will know that they are getting 5,000 assured income. Then uh, they will sell whatever crop they want no, and I, then do part-time jobs. Uh, and I... I, I, I... I think, I think there is a realization that MSP is not the uh, be-all and end-all as far as the agrarian or prices is concerned. Us. Ideas like income support with some states like, yeah, or with some states like Telangana, etc. have taken forward. Uh, perhaps ought to have been things that this government should have taken forward. Jaggi, I'll give you the final word and then get wrap-up comments from both Mr. Sinha as well as uh, Manish Tiwari. Uh, at the end of it, uh, Jaggi, you know, you've done a fairly extensive interview uh, with the Prime Minister. Uh, what's the thinking at this point in time as we head towards 2019, especially when it comes to the economy. Is there appetite now to do things like strategic disinvestment or is it really going to be uh, sort of gearing up towards the election, so housekeeping, so to speak? 
No, I would certainly think that uh, he is gearing up for the elections and all economic decisions will be directly connected to the elections and what will deliver short-term thing, which is why he's talking about the Ayushman Bharat and other things, because those are the things that are going to get launched in October and they will hopefully deliver some political mm. dividends. But I think it can't deliver it that fast. I think the logical thing, the MSP hike, of course, will come very shortly in a few days, as long as the finance ministry yeah. is willing to yeah. put the bill. So I don't, uh, the economic thinking is at this point short term, but Modi was very clear that he is definitely putting the disinvestment plans that have already been cleared by cabinet through. He said it's a matter of timing. He said if I can't get a reasonable price, mm. I may not sell now, but it may sell a little later. Mm. Mm. That's so what some, about some selling to LIC, yeah. just like IDBI Bank? Sorry, what is that? Yeah. No, see, that's, that's a bad I said, what idea. About, what the... about transferring one asset from one government balance sheet to another, which is what they're doing with IDBI Bank? See, I have a slightly different view. As far as the government is concerned, it is a wrong thing. You cannot use the LIC as your funding agent. However, I think from the LIC's point of view, it makes a lot of sense to buy the bank because it is... Uh, mm. Every bank owns an insurance company. Why shouldn't an insurance company own a bank? Synergy is there. So for them, it is a good thing, mm. you know. So it is just that whether they would overpay okay. for the same price for the bank or not, that's the only issue that LIC should be concerned with. Hmm? Huh? Okay, uh, gentlemen, uh, Mr. Sina, let me give you the final say. Uh, uh, the will and the political appetite to go through with uh, uh, economic reforms, perhaps short term in nature, uh, that's the sense that uh, Jaggi got at the end of that interview. Well, uh, let me say that <coughs> Jaggi is not right. When he says that neither Manish Tiwari nor I have any clue about what needs to be done on the farming sector, he has not spoken to me, so I can speak for myself and say he should yeah. not have made this comment. Uh, number two, the economy is not doing well, despite 7.7% quarterly growth figure, which is the latest figure. And there is sector in sector after sector there is distress. It's not merely agrarian, the agrarian sector which is in distress. A whole lot of other sectors are in distress. Job creation on the basis of anecdotal evidence. Just go to Tirupur and find out what is happening to job creation. And you will come back chastened. And all this talk in TV channels about job creation will be completely and thoroughly exposed. So we have problems serious problems in the economy and what Mr. Modi is trying to do is to put the blame on the previous regime. The previous regime will not be uh, in, uh, uh, on the, uh, on, in, under judgment in the next election. It will be the Modi regime. On the previous regime, people have already given their verdict. So it is, there is no gain saying what UPA did or did not do. He has to show what he did, and I am confidently saying that on the economic front, there is not much that this government has to show. All right, gentlemen, we will have to leave it there. Yashwan Sina, Manish Tiwari, and R. Jagannathan, appreciate you joining us here on the political exchange to take us through the Prime Minister's uh, comments to Swaraj in an interview that he has done stating the state of the economy. With that, we'll take a break. There's a lot more coming up. Don't go anywhere.